Hi, everybody. I'm Rick Dancer. Welcome to Get Real with Rick Dancer. Happy President's Day. <laughs> Whatever that means. You know, I'm surprised we don't have a Hallmark card for presidents. Like, you know, you could pick your favorite president and send it to somebody or pick the president that you think sucks the most and send that to somebody you want. I don't know. I'm sure I'm surprised they haven't come up with a better way to market this. Um, you know, I don't know. Maybe that's just me. Our show is sponsored tonight by Chris Daniel Family Dentistry, where everyone is welcome. I uh, just had a nice conversation with Dr. Bratlin, and uh, we're going to be airing some of that on there. But they have a denturist on staff now, and uh, they can make partials, full dentures, the whole bit. And of course, uh, crowns is his specialty, and I have two of them. Um, as you get older, <laughs> you need more crowns. But we also did an interview recently with this hygienist, and she gave some really great tips on how to keep your teeth cleaner so you don't end up with so many cavities. And Dr. Bratlin also talks about some stuff he puts on everybody's teeth now that can help you keep from having cavities in between your teeth. So check him out. He knows everything about dentistry. And also New Leaf Hyperbarics and Massage, Matt McCarl and all his staff over there, uh, making people comfortable with too much oxygen. You can never have too much oxygen. You get into a hyperbaric chamber and you just sit there and you feel so good. And he has some now that are like a, almost like a small tent. And uh, so people with different abilities who are in wheelchairs, or if you have a couple of kids and yourself and you want to go in there together as a group, it makes it much easier. So New Leaf Hyperbarics and Wellness Center, just ask for Matt McCarl and be sure and tell all these people when you go there that you saw this on Get Real with Rick Dancer. So it's not often that I will call a friend and say, hey, you should come on the show and just ask me questions. I had Tim Schley, who works with me, recently ask your questions, and he had some of his own. But then I thought, oh, Albert Roy would be great. And uh, just have him come on and just I'm just going to be really honest. You know, hey, Al, how you doing? Hey, how we doing, Rick? Hey, I was listening to a radio report today, and they were talking about that they'd had a politician on their, on their radio show. And they said she was so stilted and gave the answers that you'd expect in a professional manner. But it was just um, it was just awful. He said it, it just reminded you. He says, I think we're all done with that. And we just want people to be real. And I thought, what a perfect day for you and me to be doing this show. Um, th th that would be awesome. So what a great name for a show. Get real. Get real. I, you know, when people ask me, why did you come up with that name? And I said, because I think after being on television so long that I was anything but real, you couldn't be real because, um, you know, they'd fire you. And I think coming out of that, it was really for me personally to get real with Rick Dancer. And I'll tell you, there's a cost. Um, I'm, I'm right now unable to do lives for 50 more days on Facebook because I reposted a picture you sent me <laughs> of Hunter Biden in a bikini with balloons flying over whatever, probably Montana. And, and it was so innocent. And, and then they got me a second time and I didn't even repost it. So I, I think we're all to a point where we're just wanting to get real. So I thought, yeah, why don't you just come on and you kind of run the show and ask me questions and whatever we want to do. Well, fabulous. I, I'm excited about this. Okay. Yeah, um, I, now, uh, uh, you know, disclosing, you know, all information here. I'm not an interviewer, but I have no interviewer skills here like you do. You are the news guy. So uh, so this is uh, uh, new territory for me. So I called up Joe Rogan and uh, Ben Shapiro and asked them for some tips. Uh -huh. well, hopefully this will pull out pretty good. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm glad they were able to talk with you and so accessible. <laughs> exactly. Because they're in my contact list. Yeah. <laughs> so I was just kind of, you know, I was thinking about this, doing this. And I thought, you know, you've got kind of different audiences now. You have the hometown, you know, for, for years. But now you're in a new place, building a new audience and things like this. And probably some people may not know your story. Um. So I, I kind of wanted to approach this like an origins kind of uh, thing for the beginning. Okay. Okay. Figure out who you, you know, who, who is this Rick Dancer guy that we're hearing about now? So, so first of all, where were you born? Uh, Hillsboro, Oregon. So you are an Oregonian, true Oregonian. I, I was a native born Oregonian 
uh, for 62 years. Okay. And so you ended up in college where? Uh, Pacific University in Forest Grove, Oregon, um, after I taking two years of community college to get my grades up from a 1.67 when I graduated from high school, I, I majored in um, socialization and I minored in education in high school. So I had to turn that around and there were consequences to that. So then I could get into a private university, but it took two years of community college to do that. Cool. So, so you, so you weren't always perfect. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Only my hair. Only the hair. <laughs> so, um, so you're at, so you're up at Forest Grove, and um, you met Kathy there. Is that true? Well, I met her. Kathy lived in Portland area. Um, so I have a twin sister who started working at a clothing store. Um, it, she got married. My twin sister got married. She moved to Cedar Mills. Uh, started working at a clothing store with this cute girl named Kathy, and so she introduced us, and we went out for God, four years, I think, and. I've been married for almost 40. And, and you were, uh, what was your major in, in college? Uh, communications emphasis on journalism. So, so was this always your goal? Uh-uh. I never had one. <laughs> you just I think I helped. didn't, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And then when I took, I, uh, I took an internship. I went, I got into Pacific University and I just kind of picked communications because I went, okay, whatever. Um, and then I, I took an internship at KGW TV in Portland, Oregon, and it's a big TV station. And I went in there and Mount St. Helens blew up that year in 1983. I think it was 82, something like that. And I got to sign my life away on a piece of paper, get in a helicopter with Ann Curry um, and fly into St. Helens, the crater get out of it and be able to feel the heat from that crater on my feet. And I was hooked. I said, Oh my gosh, I have access to so much stuff by being in the media. This is awesome. I had so, to hike that thing. You got a free ride in a helicopter. Just flew in, landed, stepped out, got back in, off we go. What a deal. Wow. <laughs> I hadn't, I hadn't heard that. Yeah, um, no, that's, that's kind of what hooked me. I just, I just, I think I just realized that it was, I was going to be on the, on the front end of everything. You know what I mean? If I did this job, I'd have access to people, to information, to stuff that other people don't get access to. And I did. So you ended up getting a TV job. Was it down in like Bandon or? Coos Bay. Coos so Bay. I, I got a radio job at a, at this, I took a job at a radio station in Coos Bay, actually Coquille. Um, which isn't the end of the world, but you can see it from down there. And, um, and, and then I fell in love with the town and then I became like, I did that for six months and then the TV station saw what I was doing because I was working really, really hard and um, knew that I was trained in television, went to TV there, worked there two and a half years, went to KVAL TV in, in Eugene for two years as a weekend anchor and reporter, and then got the anchor job at KEZI. Um, and I did that for 20 years. Right. That's, that's where I came into the story. That's why I saw you on TV every night. Um, uh, you and um, Lisa, Lisa Birch. Birch. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. And um, so I, I hear you say a lot. Uh, your dad was a uh, worked in education. He worked. He was a teacher, a speech teacher at Hillsborough High School. And then when I was born, he needed a better job. So he got um, you know, more money. And so he went to work for the Oregon Education Association as a negotiator. So what is what's the biggest thing your dad? What's the legacy that your dad left you? You know, I, I it's, it's funny. It's probably probably the tenacity to just go after a question that this, that that's what a lot of people don't understand that get angry with me because I'm so outspoken about censorship. So outspoken about the way we've handled COVID so outspoken about people silencing information because that is that <clears throat> I think that's what I learned from him is there's no such thing as not asking a question. You, you always push 
you, you push until you get that question answered. And I'm not going to be satisfied with no or with answers that don't make any sense. And so I think that's probably, I didn't know it at the time. I mean, he also didn't listen to me a lot, <laughs> you know? And so I've learned in later years that part of the, you know, my, my thing has always been, I, I do this because I think everybody has a voice and they should be able to use it, whether I like it or not. And I didn't know where I got that. And I think I got it because he didn't really listen to me. And so there was that growing up with that frustration. So in me, it created this thing that I, that is the most appalling thing to me in the world. If you're not listening to other people and you're not listening. So I don't want anybody else to feel like that. And so it drives me. And I think when I was a news anchor and stories, a lot of the stories I told were of people who were disenfranchised, who didn't fit in, who got overlooked, who were bullied, who labeled and all that. So it's kind of my way of getting back at myself and giving me a voice by giving other people a voice, I guess. So, so I always saw you on the news, uh, uh, you know, doing your, your newscasts and stuff. But there was an event uh, that happened uh, when you were newscasting that really forced you to become the endearing news broadcaster of Eugene. Right. Uh, and that was the Thurston shooting. Yeah. It was a bad day. What happened? Um, I was at... I. I was at home and I was going to head down to the gym, which was actually right next to Thurston high school. And I was on my way and a neighbor called and she said, did you hear there's a shooting at Thurston? And I just got in my car, drove there, um, called the newsroom, went down. And then there's just people, bloody people being hauled out of the school. And now, I, just real quick. So this was America's first school shooting. No, it was because it happened after Cal Columbine. Okay. So, but, but it's, it's when a whole rash of them <clears throat> was, were happening. <clears throat> and, um, excuse me, and we were after Columbine. It was just kind of a, a, a trickle effect. And um, we had, I think, more than a dozen kids were injured, shot. Two boys, Michael Nicholson and Ben Walker, were murdered, as were the shooter's parents. Um, the Kinkles uh, were also murdered. And the and Kip Kinkle, uh, a, one of the a high school student, is the one who did all of this. And um, so we were out there all day, all night. Um, and what what really changed for me was when um, I was standing at the in a group of people, and the principal was reading the names of the kids who'd been shot. Nobody knew if they were dead or not. And he read this one kid's name, and the woman next to me just screamed like, like a deer being shot and passed out on the ground next to me. And I was on the air <clears throat> and not, not at that time, but I was on the air and Lisa Virch asked me, so Rick, what's the hardest thing you've seen? And I started to repeat that story and I started crying like, like not just a little, yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, it broke me. And I was so mad because as a kid, I cried really easily and I always got teased for it. And I was so mad. And I'm like going, Rick, you dumbass. I mean, here you are on national television because we were all over the world. I mean, they were broadcasting because no one else was there yet. So we're all over the world and I'm crying. And later that day, um, the engineers called me in from our station and said, Rick, when you started to cry, the engineers in New York City we're all going, dude, dude, hey, look at this guy. Man, this guy's losing it. Oh, my God. He must really care about that town. Because they're so used to people getting on and performing. And I was not performing. I was reacting. So and so this is kind of you're leading me where I wanted to go. So you broke a, you broke a cardinal rule of journalism. Yeah. You're, you're not supposed to be part of the story. Right. And I was part of the story because it was my town. Mm -hmm. So that day, um, I started I started interviewing people, and they were coming to me first, like kids who'd been in the library or in the cafeteria. They took all these kids and put them in the library, who had been in the cafeteria to protect them. There's a TV in there, 
And they were coming out one by one and I'm grad, they're coming right to me and I'm getting them. And my boss is calling me going, how are you getting all these interviews like that? I said, I don't know. They're just coming to me. And about two o'clock in the afternoon, a boy came out and he said, so did you notice that everybody's coming to you first? I said, yeah. And he goes, it's because we were watching you and we saw you cry. And we said to each other, that guy cares more about us than the story. Everybody go to him first to tell what you saw. And I, something clicked for me that day, you know, where I learned that being a reporter meant, didn't mean hiding who I am and being, um, it was okay to be part of the story because I couldn't help it. I was part of the story. Mm -hmm. um, so <clears throat> it kind of changed the way I reported from then on. I didn't give a shit. If people, you know, if I'm covering a murder or something, you know, I'm going to be legit and doing that stuff. But when I'm covering a story about a human being, I'm a human being. And I'm going to go in there and be a human being and let them tell their story. So it just changed so much about who I was and how I did things. And I got made fun of for it. You know, people would, um, when you're riding on the top, there's all kinds of people reaching to try to take you down. And, you know, I mean, I even ended up, I remember at Thurston, the thing that I don't tell a lot of people, but it, I guess I do now, um, <clears throat> that there was a, there was a moment when something happened and somebody asked me a question and I said, oh yeah, you know, as a journalism person, this is like a circus. This is like your day, your dream, because all these people are around, everything's happening and it's like, you know, this is like what, what you wait for as a journalist. And then I went on to say, but for me, this is so much different because it's my town. Well, they took that little segment and they started passing it around to journalism schools. And even Peter Jennings mentioned it on a newscast. And I was being used as an example. They were trying to use an example of the trashiness of news because they were going to take off the part where that's not me because I'm here. And they were using it in schools. And they never knew who it was because they couldn't find the tape. I feel like God hid it. But they tried to, they called my station. They, I didn't know about this for like a month because we were so busy. They thought this is just going to really screw you up and you're not going to be able to do your job. So I didn't even know about it. But here they were making fun of me in the background, trying to use me as an example of what the sleazy reporters were when all the sleazy reporters were coming, were the ones reporting on that who came in and did do exactly what I was talking about. So they twisted my words, took it out of context. And, um, you know, and uh, that was my first real taste of what was to come, you know, with, with the rest of my future. Um, Cause then I ran for office. Then I, now I'm doing when I, when I speak out, I could sit here while I'm talking to you thinking, this is exactly what people do to me now is they take your words out of context to make them try to fit what they want to say. Um, and I just, I don't put up with it, you know? So, so yeah. So the uh, agenda driven um, media today. Yeah. The, um, so, so if you were to sit in front of a, a group of college kids in a journalism class today, um, how would you tell them to, how do you balance the professionalism of a reporter with um, the fact that you can cry and be human? I don't think they'd listen to me. You may not um, ever get that invite. <laughs> no. And I, I, I would, a lot of times the, the university of Oregon was right there. A class would have me once and then they wouldn't invite me again. The students would love it um, because I was being real, but the professors would never invite me back. I remember when I lost, when I quit my job then I ran for public office, then I was looking for a journalism job and they told me, I went to the U of O and, you know, experienced journalists just to teach a class or something. And they said, well, you know, you're going to have to teach how to be a reporter the old fashioned way. And I said, why? Nobody's doing that anymore. This is a whole new world. We have the Internet. I, I mean, shouldn't we be teaching kids how to relate to people and doing this their job in a different sort of way, not doing the old kind of journalism? Because nobody's doing that anymore. And I didn't mean your sources and all that. I meant the old fashioned kind of journalism that was just falling flat on its face. TV news ratings are dropping. They still are. And you're going to re replicate this whole system. 
Well, needless to say, I never got a call. <laughs> never. And, and that turned out, I guess, uh, to be a good thing because you then, as you mentioned, uh, came up with this newfangled idea of running for Secretary of State of Oregon. Yeah, against <clears throat> who was the current governor um, up until the end of or the second week of January or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Ran for public office and always wanted to always said, you know, I'd interview a lot of politicians in my day. Um, and I'd say, I'm never going to do it like that. I'm going to answer every question people ask me and I'm going to do it the way I feel fit. And I did. And I lost, <laughs> but I did it the way that I, I will never walk away from that experience and say, um, that I, I, what, what that I, uh, follow the, the bullshit. You know what I mean? If people ask me a question, I answered the question as best I could. Mm -hmm. I didn't go try to lead them off onto another topic that I wanted to talk about. So it was a great experience. I don't think I would ever do it again. I might, if I'm in Montana. I might, I don't know. I, I could not represent, I can't what represent. The thing? What was huh? the best thing about it? The best thing is it. <laughs> oh, it Right, the first thing that comes to mind, my balls grew bigger. Um, I, I think that took, so the news, when you're a news person, everybody knows you, everybody likes you, that talks to you. The people that hate you don't say anything. So you're seen as in, in your own eyes, like, you know, I'm untouchable. When you run for office, you're a piece of shit and they're going to let you be that. And they're going to point it out all the time. And they tried to make me look like just some pretty boy news guy. So it really made you kind of sit down and go, who am I really? Because the Rick Dancer that I was on the news is dead. And now this new Rick Dancer is being created. But the one that's running for office is just getting me from point A to point B. So it, it kind of prepared me for the pandemic, my response, how I'm going to live my life. And... Right now, you know, where I'm at, um, doing my world, doing my job. Um, I don't think I could have ever done this had I not gone through that because it just made you, I mean, literally a newspaper would come out and you just go, what are you going to say about me? I remember walking to the, down to the paper box and you just be shaking going, oh God, I don't want to read this, you know? And then it, <clears throat> cause you know, they just were so nasty, um, so, so you got to see <clears throat> the underbelly of the political machine. Yeah, experience it. And I saw how reporters treat people and probably how I treated people. So it was, um, you know, it was a great lesson in uh, destruction of hypocrisy in your own life. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's like, it's like, it's like God putting a mirror in front of your face and you're going, I don't want to see this. I don't want to see this. You have to look. I don't want to see it, Rick. You have to look. You can't get rid of this unless you see it. And once you see it, the truth will set you free. And so then you lost. And then you look. But, but then you lost. Yeah. Then I lost and I said, okay, so God, um, I, I, quit my job and, and I did what I thought I was supposed to do. And I do think it was what I was supposed to do. And then I lost. And I think that's what I was supposed to do too. But, but then God says, okay, now. And so in my mind, I think, okay, well, I've done two bad that, you know, two, lo two losses, I get a gain. Right. And then I get prostate cancer. <laughs> you end up with cancer. That's right. yeah. So then it was like, I'm 50 years old and I have cancer to the most male part of your life that you could have cancer for. And of course, everybody says, well, it's the easiest cancer to treat. I go, yeah, you tell me as a man that's 50 years old that, you know, you have the possibility of losing your abilities down there, um, that that's the best cancer you could get. So then I just got even bigger balls <laughs> because you had to talk about your balls. <laughs> We had a lot of those conversations. We have a lot of those. Okay. I became known in, in Eugene Springfield for talking about erections. Yeah. <laughs> um, so 
you're sitting in the doctor's office uh, and you find out that news and they, they say the word, they say, you've got cancer. And um, what went through your head? I was sitting at home at the kitchen table. My wife, I was on the counter and Kathy was at the kitchen table and I, the nurse called and she said, um, the doctor is going to call you back. Uh, he needs to give you the results. And every other time I'd called, because I'd had five years of going through to see if I'd had it. They kept thinking I had it and always no. And the nurse always answered. So this time the doctor had to answer. I just looked at Kathy. I said, oh, shit, I have cancer. So we sat there for an hour and just, I mean, I'm not comparing myself with Christ, but if Christ was bleeding, sweating blood, that's what it felt like. Like you just thought, and then when he said it, you just, you just, you're, you know, I'm sitting down, but you're just, your whole world just goes, it's just like a fog. And, and it was, it was, I mean, it was horrible. It was just months. I mean, it just of reinvent, you know, re, you know, everything that had ever happened to me always, you know, you, it was like, you, I never said why me God. Cause I kind of figured real fast. This is part of my life. This is what I'm supposed to do. And I don't know why I have no idea, but for some reason, cancer is part of my journey. So when I was born, there was no surprise. God had it already planned. And when Somebody would go to God, I'm sure, and say, hey, Rick Dancer has got cancer. He says, oh, is it 2010 already? Oh, yeah, that's on, right on schedule. We're good. And um, it took, you know. You don't think God was surprised by this at all? <clears throat> no. And, 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 you know, and now on the other side of that, you know, it's been what? What is this? It's been 13 years. Um, and it's probably been like one of the best things that ever happened to me. Cause it Why? made me, cause I had to question my priorities. I had to question, you know, you know, I mean, everything works, but I used to have, I'd have to question, what if I can't get an erection ever again? Is that still, who am I then? Um, you know, um, I mean, stuff like that, that's really stupid, but it isn't because every guy can relate to that, you know? And, and I think it was also that, you face death, even though prostate cancer is not usually doesn't kill people. Um, you still, you're looking death in the face and you're kind of going, um, I survived, you know? I mean, I, I, I remember I have a video that I did right after I had it and I didn't air it for a couple months because it was too raw. <laughs> it was really raw. And it was like, I'm not afraid to die because I don't think I'm going to die. I don't want to live with cancer. Like, or like I'm due now for another PSA. So every year you have to go in and face that again. And that's what I didn't want to do. I didn't want to have to be a survivor and, and, and wonder, you know, I, I have a neighbor here in Montana who just had a heart attack and had open heart surgery and stuff. And you think, okay, now your whole life changes because you always wonder if I exert myself too much, am I going to die? Well, do you think the same thing when you have cancer, not exerting yourself, but think, what if, what if something comes back, then what do I do? Mm -hmm. And you just can't, you can't live that way, you know, but nobody else does either. So you kind of just have to go, you know, I don't, I don't look at it like, you know, I, I, I know, well, that's why I think people had so much trouble, not, not people, some people had so much problem with me not getting vaccinated, but they're not me. Something I put in my body probably preservatives and food, something in the environment or something in my biology, all mixed together to create the perfect storm. And I got cancer. So why in the hell am I going to go put a vaccine in my body that's experimental? I don't know what it's going to do. I'm not afraid to die. And I don't think I'm killing anybody by not doing it. So why would I put that in my body to, to make other people happy? Fuck that. I'm taking care of me. And, and I've already experienced this thing. With the, 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 I, I'm not afraid. And so if you are, that's your problem. You deal with it. I've already done that. Somebody told me I had cancer and I had to deal with that fear. Now you're getting to deal with it. Don't put your shit on me. It irritates the hell out of me. Because we're all supposed to be cookie cutters and in a box and do what everybody else does. 
bullshit. I'm not a sheep. I'm a human being and I get to make my own choices. Sorry. No, I, <laughs> way to be real. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just so, it's, uh, people just walk in my shoes. They, they don't walk in your shoes. They tell you, go here, put my shoes on and whether they fit or not, just walk in them because I'm right. And mm -hmm. I get so, so sick of it. Ask me my story. Maybe before you judge people, ask the story and let them, and then don't judge it. It's none of your business. You don't know how I feel or what's my thing. And I'm not killing anybody. Right. So, so that takes us to, um, so, so you, you now have no job. Uh, you have cancer <laughs> yeah. and uh, you decide. You make it sound so glamorous. <laughs> I want to be Rick Dancer. <clears throat> yeah, yeah uh, really. So, uh, you decided to start your own media company. Yeah, we did a television show for a while. <clears throat> and then nobody was watching television. So all, all my clients said, you should move this to, to social media. And Facebook just started doing live stuff. So I figured it out before anybody else did and started doing Facebook Lives when nobody was doing anything like that. And um, so then, you know, then we went well website and all that kind of stuff. And we built it into a really a business that pays us well. I mean, it does really well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you and I got to hang out for, uh, uh, for some time on there. We did, uh, a tour uh, talk. A talk thing and that was fun. It we was always done Bible studies together for years. Um, so then all of a sudden, um, COVID happens. And that definitely <clears throat> huge impact on you as you were yeah. kind of just saying um but then that affected your business your life yeah, be yeah because people couldn't afford to to advertise restaurants and a lot of my clients plus you couldn't go to the businesses and my whole thing was live in your audience so Streamyard came up and we started doing it this way and it opened up a whole new world um uh, and and it makes it easier. It makes it actually more. Um, you can control the the group. It, it, you have sound. You have everything. You know. You're not. You're not. I still do a few lives um, in the field, but most of the time it's like this. It's just we found a new direction, and in that we also discovered that we didn't have to stay in Oregon in order to do our job. Now, yes, it's been harder because we've lost some clients from Oregon, although our audience is still that you know really big there. But normally it's what's really funny about it is we're gaining an audience here in Montana and we're um, like what before they crunched me with this you know little thing, we were up to half a million uh, counts reached every month. And um, now they're throttling me. Yeah. So it's you know, we're, we're reaching people and people are watching and they like our content. Um, and, you know, the I, I, I have lost people because of my positions on the the, the, the vaccination on um, immigration, you know, anything that's controversial. And I, if I have the wrong, the position that doesn't go with the cultural narrative and I talk about it, then I get, um, you know, a lot of blocks and people like that. People that used to be friends won't talk to me because we disagree now, which is just, um, it's been a really interesting um, lesson in humanity and what fear can do to control a society and people and you just have to flow with it because you can't, I, I can't turn around and control people. I can't make, I don't care if people like me. I mean, I, at some point you have to stand up for what you believe in, whether you lose people or not. And I think that's part of life. And none of, none of us have had to really do that as much, um, you know, living in Eugene and Springfield, I think I always just kind of rode the fence a little bit. I mean, I was opinionated and said things, you know, off, off and on. But um, you, for the most part, you just tried to get along. Mm -hmm. And I think once you try to get along for too long and people start taking advantage of it, not, 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 I don't think they're out, oh, let's get them. But all of a sudden the cultural message when it's not, doesn't fit your uh, morals and, and values, um, and you start, I think that's what you have going on now is people are standing up and saying, no, I'm not going to do this anymore. And I think that's healthy. So you move to a place that, that you feel is a, a better fit now. 
You know, I, I think we moved here because we, we wanted to move to Montana <clears throat> and we knew we wanted to be in a place where it's, where it's edgy and extreme because here the weather's extreme, life is extreme. Um, it's just, it, it's, it's not easy. Um, and I think we wanted that challenge. We love the state. It's beautiful. And it's just taken a while to get to know people. But, um, and it's kind of weird when you are Rick Dancer and you walk around town and you don't have to know anybody because they all know you. Now you have to work at it, you know? So I've had to relearn my skills on how to talk to people, and, and, you know, in a way that starts a conversation because I never had to start one before. I just say, yes, I am. And then there, that was the start of the conversation. So now you start from ground zero and, you know, but, um, but people, what's different here and people get all mad because they, oh, you're comparing Oregon. Um, I'm, I'm really not, but what's different here is that it's kind of like it was in Oregon 20 years ago where, um, there's more Republicans than Democrats, but nobody cares. Um, it's really about your community. Like you do what's best for the community. And yeah, there's little battles over some of the tram stuff and things like that. Um, hold on. And there's, so there's little battles that go on, but, but you don't, it, you don't experience it the same way. Um, it, it, I, I don't know how to put it. It's, it, it, you, you see some of that coming into Montana a little bit, but people are still open enough that you kind of, you can talk through it. You can have conversations about it, you know, and, and, and that's what's so different um, about this than that. Without the conversation ending up being blocked on Facebook. Is yeah. Crazy. Yeah. I mean, and it's like, you're not, nobody is looking at the position like I have to do this or I own it or, or, um, it's, you know, it, it, and, and, and I can honestly, I, I, I do. One of my biggest fears is that it'll change and, and turn that way um, because you do see a lot of influx of different people coming in. And our whole motto with Kathy and me is we're here to assimilate. We love what you have. We don't want to change it. We want to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. And I wish people would have done that when they came to Oregon because um, I think they came into our state and they brought their, their failed politics that didn't work where they were. They brought it with them and they destroyed Oregon with it. And I don't want to see that happen in Montana. And um, so we're being real careful and really open to, to conversation. So, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, you know, I realized as I was thinking about this, when you sent me the, the email to do this, um, you're really a First Amendment guy. Um, Very much so. <laughs> tell me your story. Everybody's got a right to speak and, you know, all of that. And in the First Amendment, there are five things that it talks about. So the first thing is it talks about the freedom of religion. So faith has always been a part of your um, yeah. story, right? That's been yeah. kind of central, right? Yeah. And it still is. Very much so. So so you have this, uh, a person has this faith thing, and the most natural thing a person wants to do is go tell people about it. Right. But then it talks about freedom of speech. Okay. You, you get together with a bunch of people and you got freedom of assembly. And then from there you have freedom of the press. And, and you've been involved in all of these throughout your life at different levels. And you've taken freedom of the press where you were an actual journalist with a, a fake ID on your chest. <laughs> which, you know, it doesn't, there's no such thing as a real credential for journalists um, because it's in the First Amendment. The, they had the freedom of press. There was no CNN or Fox News. It was the people that are the press. Right. And now you're the press again. Right. Right. Isn't that crazy? You're just one of we the people, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then the fifth part of the First Amendment is grievances. That we have the right to redress our grievances with the government. And this last year, you've had a lot of grievances to redress <laughs> <laughs> yeah. about your government. So, oh, so... Albert, you don't even know. And it, so it just, it, it hit me just, you really are a first amendment guy. Uh, you're all over that. Yeah. It, it you know, <clears throat> I think that I didn't even realize how big that was for me, 
but it, um, I just think, how do you get accurate information? If you're, if you get to determine, if you have a group of people that get to determine what's right and what's wrong, you know, like what's good and bad. And so I've even changed my whole idea on like books in the schools. You know, I don't want pornography in the schools, but I also don't want to be telling people, um, you know, that what, what kind of books should end up in the library and what shouldn't end up in the library. If, if, if I'm a responsible citizen, then I should be able to decide for myself. Now, I don't want people teaching my kids stuff that I don't want. I mean, I, I, there's a whole bunch of, you know, but I think that's the conversation we should all be having, not um, more censorship on either side. I don't think, I don't think Republicans should be censoring and I don't think Democrats should be censoring. You know, I, the whole thing is, um, cause, cause I think I used to always believe when I was a reporter, if I do a good job and tell both sides of the story, people will be smart enough to pick up on what they need to know and they can decide for themselves. And if they're not, that's not my problem. And I think now the media kind of thinks we need, you need to, this is the right thing to do. So you need to come on board with climate change or whatever, whatever, whatever. And if you don't, then you're not a good person. And then the people that believe that ideology end up doing the same thing. And that's the problem, I think. So in all of uh, these different pieces, these stories of the origin, your origin story here, um, there has been one consistent factor that got you through all of these things. Kathy. My, Kathy. It'd be my wife. But, and, I can and, say faith also, but I would say faith and Kathy both yeah. together because um, she's like a rock and she doesn't take things too seriously. She's like, she's not like me where I'm real, you know, I mean, things happen. I'm emotional. I'm very dramatic and, you know, that's just part of who I am. Um, she's much more thought provoking and stands back and kind of goes, wait a minute. Um, you know, and it, like, <clears throat> like when, you know, we lose a few customers or something and she'll go, Rick, we're, we're going to be fine. Don't worry about it. You know, we'll be fine. And she really is that rock that kind of gets us through. Yeah, we couldn't have done this. You know, we <clears throat> when we came here, uh, we were at a, a gym class um, in Livingston a year ago. And we were in this class and this lady play, was playing some country music and she played a Chris Stapleton song called Starting Over. Um, <clears throat> and she looked over and she goes, oh my God, this is Rick and Kathy's song. And then she plays a song and Kathy and I were up across the room from each other. By the time we're done, we had tears running down our eyes. That became kind of our theme for 2022, that song starting over. Well, then we're with my sister. We hear this Aaron Lewis guy uh, singing a song called uh, Tangled Up in You. And it's about <clears throat> how two people get tangled up and how did you, how can you stay with me? And how do we just, we, we just keep getting tangled up in each other. And we said the other night we were sitting there drinking a beer and I said, I think this is our song for 2023 is tangled up in you. And, and Albert, I think if you're a rope and you've got mm -hmm. Kathy's one strand and I'm the other strand, you need a third strand to make it strong. And so when we're tangled up in, we're tangled up in each other and God and the three of us together intertwine. Um, we'll go on to the next thing, whatever that is. And I have, you know, I have a year or two before I, want to retire, especially thanks to Joe Biden, but, um, you know, <clears throat> you know, but, but we're also, God knew all this and I was born for such a time as this. Yeah. So, so we know that this is exactly what we're supposed to be doing. So, so for the next couple of years, then, um, where are Rick and Kathy going? We don't know. What do you want to we, do? We don't have a forever home. We want to travel. Uh, we're going to live in the house. We love our house. We're going to live there for whatever amount of time that is. And then I don't, we really don't know. We, we did meet a young woman who she and her husband, they're in their twenties. And she told us we were having a beer somewhere. And she said, yeah, we're going <clears> to, <throat> we sold everything. We're going to get a van and we're going to drive around the country uh, for three years and then come back and start a family. And Kathy and I looked at each other and I went, we could just do that the opposite way <laughs> is we already have our family. Let's go travel around. So I don't know. I honestly don't know. I quit making plans. <clears throat> um, I just kind of follow. I become a really good follower, not of people and not of manipulated messages, but of God. So, so 
will a camera always be a part of that? Oh yeah. That's how I tell, that's kind of how I, it's kind of my medicine besides working out storytelling is how I tell my is so with camera, with video, when when we go on a trip, I'm always shooting stuff because I'm seeing life as a story. And Kathy understands that now it's taken a while, but she gets that. So she kind of digs into her head and I dig into my writing when I'm riding a bike and looking at this, at everything around me, I'm writing, I'm hearing words, you know, and I'm, I'm writing them in my head and then I have to put them somewhere. That's just part of who I am. So um, yeah, I think a book, I think there's going to be a book. I think uh, there's going to be more of this, um, less of this, I hope in the future, um, more, um, I'd like to teach people how to podcast. That's kind of one of the things I'm thinking about is doing classes, courses, charging people and teaching them how to do what I do. Um, Cause there really is a skill level here that we can I help could sign with. up for that class then. Cause clearly <clears throat> I need some help with this. Well, it would be really fun. And I think it, there's some really great little tips and things like that, that we could offer. And I'd love to see people doing more real kind of podcasting. So, yeah. Well, well Albert, I, I have, um, if I don't do these under a certain time, they won't go on. I have to, I have to cut them back and put them on um, Instagram. We got eight more pages of questions though. We're going to have to do this again. And we will. <laughs> I thank you, my friend for pushing me a little and getting me to start thinking about stuff. I think this is all part of where I'm supposed to be right now. My pleasure. It's always good to see you. All right. You too, my man. I'll see you later. Take care. All right. Bye Albert. So there you go. Um, people looking for real, I guess that's who I really am. And Albert would know that cause he's a good friend and, and uh, he uh, gets me to talk about things um, that I normally probably wouldn't talk about. Got to thank our sponsors, Chris Dental Family Dentistry and Denture Center for this, and also New Leaf Hyperbarics and Wellness Center. Uh, we couldn't do this without our sponsors. If you want to be a sponsor, we just had three more people sign up. If you want to be a sponsor, just get a hold of me, Rick at rickdancer.com. Find out how to do it. We can help you get your message out there, despite Facebook and their arrogance. <laughs> We have many ways to get around them. All right. Have a good night. Thanks, you guys. Mm -hmm.